thank you very much for having me. No, I'm good, thanks. You have to get right off there for it to be able to do that. Okay. I, know, I think uh, four years ago, I don't know if anybody else remembers, but I was here. This one instead? Oh, yeah, I'll do that. Like Phil Donahue. Uh, four, four years ago, I was here. Can you guys hear me okay? Right to the back? No? There. There. Okay. And I, um, well, you're sitting so far back. You could come all the way up here. I, um, I actually, now that I've been here four years, I actually recognize quite a few faces, which is uh, both a good thing and a bad thing because either people are here because they were happy to come see me or they're here because I haven't made them better yet. And so they're, they're here to find out what car I drive. <laughs> And I, I recognize many faces. Now, I actually checked the website this afternoon to make sure that I was going to be here on time, 7.30. And then it said Dr. Bowersack was going to present on incontinence and erectile dysfunction. And I was like, what? Because, uh, as you'll see from my title, post-prostatectomy incontinence, that's what we're going to cover tonight. And I, I, I'm happy to come back on a, and talk about erectile dysfunction as well. But this is a big topic because... I got a lot to say about it, and you're going to figure out as soon as we get into this. Now, I, I am a urologist. I am a prostate surgeon. I take what? What's that? Hold my right like that, eh? There you go. Okay, you're. Yeah, and uh, I am a surgeon, so I'm just like the other surgeons that you guys have seen in town here, and many people here maybe have had surgery. They maybe have had radiation. They may have had cryotherapy, they may have had multiple treatments, and I'm one of the urologists, so I work at Rocky View, I work with the same guys that you guys have seen down there. But what do I do differently? I do specialize in leakage, and that's incontinence in men, women, and then the neurogenic bladder, those are the spinal cord injured patients. When, when I set out to put this together, my goal was to figure out and see if I could help you understand why men have leakage after surgery. And because your temptation might be to think, well, the surgeon made a mistake, but it's, it's more complex than that. And you'll see that. And I, I actually can see somebody in here that I've operated on. And uh, I can see that um, that way I can get out of it. It's not just the surgeon. There's many factors. <laughs> and also understand how it can be treated. Now, I actually originally developed this slide when I was giving this talk to other urologists, but this is a similar journey that I take men through in my office. And yep, you'll have to wait a long time to see me in my office, and I apologize about that. But I will take you up and down this um, roller coaster. So when you're a surgeon, a man walks in, he's usually been diagnosed with prostate cancer from our biopsy downstairs. And He's at the low point, and you guys will remember this. This is the diagnosis time. And then afterwards, if you've had a successful surgery, most men and many men, the way we pick men up these days, will have had a successful surgery. And so it's high fives all around, doctor. Pathology looks good. And then, boom, falls down the day that the man realizes, hey, where are my erections gone? Back up if something starts to work for erections. Back down when you start to realize that you're not drying up as quickly as you thought that you would dry up. So there's highs and lows. I recognize these all along the journey. And I'm with people right from surgery at the beginning, but then I'm also sometimes seeing people sent from another urologist or, a, or the Tom Baker Cancer Center for this leakage. Now, when I was putting it together as well, I wanted to try and outline and take you through because not everybody in here is a doctor, not everybody in here has gone to medical school, not everybody in here even necessarily knows what we do when we take out prostates. And then I wanted to take you through why men have leakage, because it's not always exactly as you'd think after surgery. So I always put this slide into most of my talks just to let you know that what I do is very straightforward and very simple. We have a bladder, which is the same as a pump. Its job is to fill up and empty, fill up and empty. So that's the pump part. And then men have their urethra, or their long straight tube, and that's called their outlet. And that's the long tube, just like on a pump. So you're going to fill up and you're going to empty. And that's important because, as you see when we go through, we're going to talk about the problems that lead up to men leaking after surgery. 
Um, when, as we all sit here, and uh, where we've all had some coffee or we had some water at home or something that you were drinking, your bladders are filling up. Some men have to leave. Oh, thank you. you gotta. Some, some men will have to leave. Some women might have to leave to void during the middle of the session. But our bladders should be quiet during this hour that we're in here. Like, realistically, we should all be able to sit here for an hour and not have to go pee. There's one guy checking his watch. An hour? I thought I was going to be here 10 minutes. <laughs> and um, the other thing is, as you sit here, your outlet, that's your prostate, although there may, there's fewer prostates in this room than most places in the city, your, um, your sphincter muscle, which sits there, and the urethra, those all need to be closed because that's how we're going to be dry. So we have a nice, quiet bladder that tells us we don't have to go pee, and then we need a nice, closed tube. And that way we can make sure that we're dry. But we, we mess that up after surgery or radiation or cryotherapy. Now, when, when people think about control of your urination, before your prostate surgery, you have two valves. You've got a bladder neck right here. And this is one that you can't think about. You can't close it. If you're having a pee and your cell phone rings, you can't stop this valve. This one is one that you don't think about. This one, this is the one that you can tighten. So if you were waiting for that phone call all day from TELUS because they were going to call you back, and as soon as you go to the bathroom, they call you and you want to run out, that's the one that you can tighten. And after prostate surgery, though, this one is gone because it went with the prostate, and this one is the remaining valve that is sitting there. So once again, two sphincters. You've got a bladder neck. That's one that you don't think about. And then you've got the, the sphincter here. This is the external sphincter. This is the same sphincter that can control whether you pass gas or don't. It sits all the way across your pelvic floor. And this is the one that you can tighten and relax, tighten and relax. But with surgery, we remove this bladder neck with the prostate. No matter how good we are, that, that intrinsic or that one you don't have to think about is removed. And here's a picture. So there's your prostate. There's the cancer sitting there. There's the seminal vesicle. And we remove that at surgery. We do stay away from the external sphincter. If you are the unfortunate man that has leakage, it's not because we had a bad day. It is because we can't figure out why some men are wet after surgery. We, should, we still don't know. As I stand up here, I still can't tell you why you are that unfortunate man that is wet after surgery. But here's a nice picture. We've reconstructed the bladder neck and the external sphincter. But everything depends on this sphincter now because this one is gone. Everything depends on that as to whether you'll be dry or not. Here's a picture of us removing the, a cartoon. We're removing the prostate. So the sphincter muscle will be down here. So this is what we do when we remove a prostate. We, um, we peel the prostate off the rectum at the back here, and we take it off right at the neck of the bladder. And so when we're sewing up, we get this nice cartoon. So this is the neck of the bladder and we've reconstructed it here. This is the urethra tube. The prostate used to live here, and now I've got my five stitches in, and I'm gonna sew it back together. And you can see here, the sphincter muscle is actually these fibers that run all the way around here. And we, you'll never see on your pathology that it's gonna say the sphincter was part of the specimen. So no matter who's doing your surgery, we're not in the habit of trying to take out your sphincter we leave the sphincter and we take the prostate off from the urethra and reconstruct the bladder and put you back together. But, this is the money here, before prostate surgery you had two valves. So you had one you didn't think about, you had one you could think about. After prostate surgery everything is relying on this hammock of muscle that sits below. And my own theory, this is where I'm allowed to say because I'm a medical professional and I'm allowed to give my own opinion. I saw the, what the lawyers put up there. My, my own opinion is that the reason some men have leakage and others don't is that when we're being made up by Mother Nature or whoever designed us, there must be an amount of urine control that's done by the neck of the bladder. 
and amount of urine control that is done by the external sphincter. And if you were that unfortunate man that got prostate cancer, and you were also that unfortunate man where most of your urine control is done by the neck of your bladder and less by your sphincter, you might be that man that is wet after prostate surgery. That, that's my own theory. Because I can't figure out, and I know people have heard me say this, sometimes I do surgery, I think it looks so good, I should have filmed it and played it during Hockey Night in Canada because I'm that good. The guy comes back in and he says, Doc, what did you do wrong? Another one, you feel like it's your first surgery, it was horrible, you sweat the whole thing, it was miserable, and the guy comes back and says, Doc, I love you. So you just can't figure out when you are a surgeon why one guy has such a great outcome and another guy doesn't. And there's a lot that we don't know, but this is my own theory. And I'm allowed to give my own opinion. Now, will I leak after surgery? So, absolutely, that minute I take out your catheter after prostate surgery, whether you had it done with a robot, laparoscopic, or an open surgery, the first few weeks you will have leakage, absolutely. You'll have leakage with activity, you may have leakage when you try to pass gas and not urine, you may have leakage when you bend over to tie your shoes, absolutely you're going to have leakage. But the leakage should get better quickly. And I tell men that if I called you a week after I took out your catheter, you'd say, Doc, you messed up. But if I called you a month after, you'd say, Doc, you messed up. But now that I lie down at night, I'm starting to get drier. Or now that when I sit there, Doc, I'm not wet. But when I go to jump up or have an unexpected movement or my bladder's full, I'm still wet. But as you get out to two months to six months, this leakage should be getting better. It should be getting better. And... Um, Beyond six months, most men that have had their prostate removed, this is most men, are almost dry or they have a pad in for just in case. But it does take out there to six months. Now, I'm impatient, so I tell my patients, after six months, I'm going to move on this. But this is what the big dogs show with their fancy papers at Harvard, that if you wait, it will get better. And so as you look out to 12 months and 24 months, this is people getting drier. So you can see that here, look at, if I called you just exactly as I said, if I called you at one month, you're getting drier. Almost daily you're getting drier. But as we get out to 12 months, right out here, most men are getting better, even still. But I'm impatient, and so I usually like men to be wearing one pad per day at six months or drier. Most surgeons will wait six months to see if they recover. Many surgeons will wait one year, and if your surgeon says to you, don't worry, Don, it'll get better. Um, beyond one year, I'm not that optimistic. I, I personally think at six months, you should start be asking, saying, hey, why isn't this getting better? What are we gonna do about it? That's my own opinion. And again, that's why I put it, in my opinion, I am impatient, and I know there's somebody in this room that I've operated on, and I don't know how they're doing, but honestly, at six months, I need to be doing something. So what is the chance of leaking after prostate cancer surgery? This depends who you ask. Because if you asked men, that's a lot different than if you ask surgeons, right? Surgeons, they want to sound really good. They're really important. We beat our chests. And so it, it depends who you ask, surgeon or patient. It also depends how you ask it. If you go back and look through my chart, that's a lot different than if I mailed out a questionnaire to somebody. And I recently did that, people that I'd done sphincters on in the past four years, I recently have mailed out a questionnaire to find out when you answer the questions, the tough questions, how are people doing? And that's a lot different than just looking through your chart. It also depends how you ask, because if you ask a man, are you wet after prostate surgery? Most men are actually gonna say, yep, I've got some leakage. But are you wearing pads? So fewer men are wearing pads. And are you bothered by it? And some men will say, well, I'm not bothered by it. But another man, he has a single drop of urine in the day, and he's really upset. He really wants to come and see somebody and talk about it. So it really depends who you ask. But oh, we got all the way to the end there. Um, as we, I got to just sneak back here. As we. Um, 
do operations, like I'm a surgeon, just like the other guys, I think we really need to be able to say to each other, this is my results, this is what I tell my men. I'm doing this one-handed here. And um, move down there. Slide show from current slide. There we go. As a surgeon, I, I feel I need to be able to tell people, and if you've been to my office, I usually write this stuff out by hand, and realistically, that you will have some leakage is about 10%. The risk that after your prostate surgery, you'll say, doc, you gotta do something about it, it's surprisingly rare. It, it is a low number. Now, I always tell men though, if you're that 1%, it's 100%, right? If you were that guy that's wet, Absolutely, you're frustrated. You say, you gotta do something about this, doc. Now, certain things make the situation worse, all right? So if you've had a previous TURP or rotor rooter, um, you may have worse trouble with leakage after. If you've had previous radiation and then you end up getting your prostate removed, which is an unusual um, situation, incontinence could be horrible. If you were older at the time of your surgery, or you had trouble with your bladder before surgery, you may have more trouble. If you were wet before surgery, it's hard for me to say that you're gonna be drier after. And uh, these guys, they really like to talk about how great they are, because they wanna show that if you go to a center that does less prostates, you're gonna be worse than if you go to a place that um, in New York City where these guys work. And that is important. If you're going to a place that does one prostate per year, I would be a little nervous. In Calgary here, most surgeons are doing lots of prostates. We're not tripping over each other to do one prostate per year. And uh, all the surgery in the city is done at Rocky View. We do 400 per year, and they showed that you're gonna have a better outcome if you go to a hospital that does more than um, 20 per year. Now, you might be sitting here thinking, why is he talking about surgery? I had cryotherapy, or I had brachytherapy, or I had radiation therapy. This discussion about leakage or wetness applies to you because if you're having leakage afterwards, um, the same treatments I'm going to walk you through when I see it. If you say, well, what's my chance of being wet after brachytherapy? The numbers are anywhere, 0 to 7%. Same with cryotherapy. And a lot of men in this city, they will get radiation therapy, and then if they have their PSA rising, they will get cryotherapy or freezing therapy. And you, I know there's men in this room that have had that, and then they've had that, and they've had trouble, and I've seen them. Now, so anatomy. Two valves, one valve after surgery. Why do men leak, though? So let's take a closer look, because there are actually three types of leakage after prostate surgery. Three? You, you wanted to blame the surgeon. How could he mess up in three different ways? So these are the three types. And if you're a woman in this room, these apply to you, but for a different set of purposes. Overflow incontinence. So this is the least likely. So this is where your bladder is so full, it's more common after radiation or cryotherapy. Slowly, your bladder's gotten so full that you actually leak a bit of urine all the time because you're just so full. Urgency incontinence. This is that overwhelming urge that, oh my God, I need to pee right now before I can get to the toilet I'm peeing myself. And that, that's quite common after radiation because the radiation burns can cause this, this to happen. And then this one, this is the real money after prostate surgery. This is the one that we're up against the most, and that's stress incontinence. It's the same leakage that women have after having multiple babies. The pelvic floor is weak, the muscles are weak, and when you cough and sneeze and lift and bend over, you're gonna leak some urine. So I put this giant red arrow to show that it, the numbers definitely increased towards this being the most common. But most of you that have sat down in my office know that I want to rule out this one. I want to treat this one before I move on to this one. And we're going to come to each one now. So overflow incontinence. So there again, number three is way more than number two is way more than number one. But we shouldn't forget overflow because this is one that I don't want to miss. So again, this is your bladder is so full that you are losing a bit of urine all the time, like a toilet that's overflowing. And so it's just running over the top all the time. 
And the usual cause of this is something called a bladder neck contracture or bladder neck scarring. So this is the man, he's had his prostate surgery and the catheter was taken out in the doctor's office. They reviewed the pathology and they, everybody said, fantastic, looking great doc. The doctor said, this is what you can expect over the next little while. So he goes home that day and he's wet and he's wearing his pad and he thinks, okay, the doc was pretty right on. Then, hey, I'm getting dry here, right on. This is awesome. I can't believe how fast I'm getting better. Whoa, wait a minute, I can barely pee. I'm calling my surgeon instantly because there is big trouble here. I can barely get out a drop. And that's because you've developed some scarring right where we sewed you together. And you can close down to where you end up just with a pinhole. So this is not normal. This is a tiny opening. There's another tiny opening. And this is scarring right where we put you together. So we did our best work. And for some reason, you developed some scarring there. And what happens in that situation is the man is wet, he's dry, and then boom, he can't pee, and he's calling you. And if you've had a bladder neck contracture, this is a miserable condition. As a surgeon, this is an extremely frustrating condition because you think, darn it, I put these two things together, it went nicely, and oh my goodness, this man's got some scarring there. And uh, you, you know what it is as soon as the man calls. So I like to think of it as a beaver dam. So you've got a real full pond here, and then a little bit running over the top all the time, because the bladder's too full, there's some scarring at the surgery site, and the result is a little bit gets over the top. So the man is wet. He's not necessarily any wetter when he coughs and sneezes. He's not necessarily got an urgency and a frequency. He's just got a bit running out all the time, and it goes day and night. Whereas most men will know that when they lie down flat at night, they're pretty dry. In fact, they can get rid of their pads quite quickly when they lay down at night. But not this guy because he's leaking day and night. So if you come to my office, we might scan your bladder and we're just trying to see, are you walking around with half a liter or a liter in there? We may send you for an ultrasound. There could be infection in your urine. And then uh, I will probably see you over at cystoscopy and I'm gonna put my flexible telescope down because I want to look right there and I want to see whether that scarring is there. And like I said, this is what we're going to see. And uh, this is a situation we don't want to miss because if um, this guy is unhappy because he's wet, but he's also having real trouble peeing. And this one's pretty obvious, but um, it also comes into play whether you've had surgery, but it also comes into play with radiation and cryotherapy. And if people in here have had cryotherapy, with Dr. Donnelly and they had trouble peeing after Dr. Donnelly may have had to go back in and remove some tissue. He went in and he rotor rooted and um, that's the same type of thing. He's trying to open up this passageway so you can pass your water but with too many of those sometimes you'll end up with some leakage. Our typical treatment is to put the man to sleep and we will cut the scar tissue there, there and there and it will spring open and then we wait to see, is Mother Nature going to try to close it back down? Is it going to be really stubborn? Is it just a one-time treatment? And uh, it's a frustrating condition because we're treating scar tissue. And we don't know, again, why did the man form scar tissue there? And uh, what, did we, what would we do differently if we did his surgery again? And sometimes, you, as a surgeon, you just don't know what you would have done differently. So that deals with overflow. Any questions before we... We'll get rid of that because it's, it's not that interesting, but it's important to know because the story is so classic. This one, I think this is the most annoying because it's one of the most difficult to treat. This is overactive bladder. So your bladder is twitchy. So there you are, you're sitting there, you're watching the hockey game, flames are destroying Montreal. It's the third period and whoosh, you gotta go pee right now. And I mean right now, you can't even get to the washroom before you even get there, you've got to pee. You know where every toilet is. From Chinook Mall, you know where to park because you know where the washroom is, you know where the next one is, you know where the next one is. You know where if you're going from the south to the north of the city, you know every Tim Hortons, you know every SO because when you got to go look out, you're the worst person to have on a trip because you've got to stop the car between here and Edmonton in every single place. And this is the overactive bladder. And uh, 
three million Canadians have this, separate from prostate surgery. Three million Canadians just have this, and this is horrible. And it's huge. It's in men, it's in women, it's in women with, sp with spinal cord injury, it's in women with MS, it's in women that have had surgeries to lift their bladder. And so I spent a huge amount of my time treating the overactive bladder. Now, he said, well, I had surgery. Why, why would I get an overactive bladder after surgery? Well, often it existed beforehand, but you've got to remember, beforehand, you had two valves. You had a bladder neck, you had your, your external sphincter, and so when you got the urge, you could often get to the toilet in time because you got two valves keeping it closed. Now I've weakened your internal valve, it's gone, and everything is relying on that second valve and whoosh, when you gotta go look out. So you've got urgency, you gotta go right now. You've got frequency, that means you're going more than eight times per day. You've got nighttime voids, you're getting up more than two times per day, and then whoosh, sometimes you're getting urgency leakage and you gotta go right now. And it's really just a twitchy bladder. For some reason the bladder is jumpy or twitchy. <coughs> And there's actually lots of causes. Idiopathic, that's our fancy doctor word for saying we don't know what causes it. It's just there. Over here, if you had had a large prostate before your prostate surgery, you may have had some urgency frequency. If you had strictures, or that's where you've got some scarring along the water channel, you may have developed it. If you've had radiation, many people that have had radiation remember after the radiation they had to pee frequently and urgently. It may have gotten better, but it may have stayed there afterwards. If you've had a stroke or you've got Parkinson's disease or multiple sclerosis, um, that's another cause. If you've had bladder cancer, and there are some people that have had both prostate and bladder cancer, and you've had previous where we've gone in and scraped the bladder of the bladder cancer, you may be developing twitchy. And then most young women will tell you, as soon as I have an infection, I gotta go pee all the time. And that's the same thing, it's urgency and frequency. So there's lots of things that I need to think about when I'm seeing a man as to what the causes of this could be. Um, what do we do to treat it? Well, luckily there are lots of treatments. And um, the first thing though is I usually say, how much coffee do you have? I have some people that have 30 cups of coffee per day. That's too many. That's, that's three pots. That means you've got to be having coffee almost every second that you're breathing. And that's a little bit too much. I would say let's cut that back to one or two cups in the morning. Let's, let's start there. Don't do it suddenly, though, because you'll feel horrible. Fluid excess. Everybody's being told how much water they have to drink and how fantastic water is for you. It's actually nonsense. There's no proven health benefit to water because we've never proved anything. If you say, well, the doctor says I should have eight glasses of water per day, it's an easy thing to say. Makes you feel good, you like drinking water, and you get to get out of the doctor's office. It actually dates back to an obituary in the 1970s from a Dr. Stark. He was a nutritionist and he died. In his obituary they said, Dr. Stark's good health was always credited to his six glasses of water per day. That's the science behind drinking water. So all this drinking water, $1.35 for a bottle of water at, at Tim Hortons and Max. It all dates back to that. There isn't any science for it. Now, I didn't say leave here and don't drink water ever again. I'm just telling you that if you think, well, whew, I got a peeing problem, but I also have to get my eight or 10 glasses of water per day because it's really good for me, I'm going to say, why are you doing that? Don't push yourself like that. Let's just sit tight. Let's get back to and drink to your thirst. And if you're thirsty, drink, but don't feel you have to push the water. And so I like to get people to cut back if they're excessively drinking. Try to suppress the urge. So some people will tell me, Doc, if I can hold that urge for a second, it'll go away and then I can safely walk to the toilet. And that's all I mean by it. And sometimes it'll take seeing a physiotherapist to actually learn how to suppress the urge because that overwhelming urge comes, you need to stop everything, almost cross your legs, wait for that urge to go, and then safely make your way to the bathroom. There are lots of medications, and I'm gonna to come to those in a second, for this condition. If three million Canadians have it, that means 30 million Americans have it, that means a big market for these drugs. 
and then Botox, the Hollywood star stuff. We'll come to that. So this is my job as the doctor to know that there are eight different pills for overactive bladder. Now luckily most of the people I see are over 65. So now I've got only three choices that are covered by Blue Cross. I've got oxybutynin, I've got Detrol LA, and I've got Trospium. If somebody has a private drug plan, I've got eight to choose from. If they don't have any money, I've got one to choose from. And so I got all these different things that are going through my brain when I prescribe. It's not just, here's a pill, take it home. I'm considering different things, but in general, most people will try the generic or they will try this because Blue Cross will cover Detrol LA four milligrams once per day. The pills are very good. Why are there eight? Because there's side effects with them and so we need to sort out what works for you, what didn't, what the side effects are. They are medications. The fancy word is anticholinergics, but basically they quiet down the urgency, they cut down the frequency, and they actually reduce those incontinence episodes, those urgencies. A lot of people are sitting here thinking, wow, I read about this in the women's magazine. Why is he talking about it? Because if I see you and I put you through my special testing, my urodynamics, and it shows me that you've got an overactive bladder, I want to hammer that. I want to try and get it really quiet and see whether you're a lot better because I saved you going through what we're going to talk about is surgery by just giving you a medication. So in, in my practice, I've got the generic oxybutynin 2.5 milligrams twice per day or Detrol LA, which is the market leader. They are both covered by Blue Cross and um, frequently, who wants to take a pill two or three times per day? So most people know that they leave my office trying this one. Um, and it's been a good medication. The medications though have side effects and this is what everybody will remember. Dry mouth. Constipation is a risk. How bad is the dry mouth? It's about 8% of people, so it's not everybody. How about constipation? It's not everybody, it's four to 5%. Blurred vision, even fewer still. And confusion, even fewer still. But these are the things I need to warn you about because if for some reason you take the pill I gave you and you decided that you had to clean the chimney at three in the morning, I better have let you know that you might have confusion with it. It's not gonna happen, but I should let do my job. Now, the pills often work, so they take your urgency and, and leakage and make it very manageable. So you can get to the toilet. You don't need to know where every toilet is in the city of Calgary. You don't need to plan your life based on the toilet. But if it doesn't work, you may end up seeing me for this, Botox. So the same stuff all the Hollywood stars are doing to get rid of the wrinkles, I'm now doing it into the bladder, and I'm not doing it because it makes me a whack of cash. I'm doing it because it works, and we are fortunate that if I order it, it is covered at Rocky View Hospital. Covered, that's $1,000 worth of Botox that I'm gonna inject into your bladder, whereas most provinces it's not covered. So we keep that quiet because if somebody looks into it, soon it'll be gone. But I put a tiny needle up through a scope and I inject it in 20 locations throughout your bladder. You leave the hospital that day. I can do it either under a general or some local sedation. It's covered here and when, with, within one to three weeks, you say, this is fantastic. I used to have to go pee in every place between here and Red Deer and all of a sudden, my bladder is a lot quieter. At three months, you say, Doc, this is fantastic. And then about six to nine months, you say, Doc, I think you need to do this again. And this has become something that is available. It is second line, so it's not gonna be the first thing you get. I'm gonna be doing it whether you've got uh, multiple sclerosis and a lady with urgency, or I may even try it on men, say after radiation or cryotherapy. Now, though, I will honestly admit the men that are sent to me that have had trouble after radiation and cryotherapy are some of the toughest cookies to crack because it's a combination of things. You've had radiation, then you've had some freezing, and the combination of the two often is a tough situation for me to manage, but often I'll take you through all of these treatments I'm talking about. Now, this is what everybody came for. This is what the money is all about. This is stress incontinence. So this is where the man has had his prostate removed and the muscles are weak 
And I don't mean to say this, you are weak, I am strong. I mean to say it that if there's a proportion of men that are going to have leakage, it's usually because their sphincter, for some reason, isn't strong enough to hold back their urine. And um, if you don't get better somewhere in the six months to one year, I don't think you should live like that. Some of my colleagues, maybe, maybe they pat you on the knee and say, now, now, you sure are lucky not to have cancer. I personally don't think that's good enough, and I'm allowed to give my opinion. <laughs> Um, so this is exactly it. So there you are, you're lifting your weights and you've got leakage. It, it squirts out of you, whether you're lifting weights, whether you're um, bending over to, to bag the grass, it is leaking out of you and it's driving you crazy. Because there you are, you're supposed to be getting better, the cancer's behind you, and you're still wearing a diaper or a pad. And Remember, everything is relying on this one set of sphincter muscles that sit below because the bladder neck is gone and you can't hold back when you cough or sneeze. It's not every man, and in most men, we've got to remember, most men it's going to get better, but if you were that man that it didn't get better, we've got to do something. So, usually what will happen is your urologist will say, I'm going to send you to see Baverstock, and then I will usually see you. Now, what I'm about to tell you is not perfect. If it was perfect, I would be, um, have a huge head and I'd think I'm the most wonderful person, but it is not perfect. And you, you can come to my office, I got a list of people that you can call. Some of them are happy, some of them are not happy with the process and how good they are, but most people's quality of life is dramatically improved. Dramatically improved. So the things I want to know, so when we sit down, we're looking at each other. These are the things I'm going to ask you. When does leakage occur? Is it all the time? Are you running, just dribbling out of you all the time? Or is it only with activity? Is it only when you bend over to pick up the uh, ball out of the hole? Is it when you bend over to the side table to, to pick up your shoe that fell off, the, off your foot? What is it? Or is it a sudden urge? Or do you get an overwhelming urge and before you can get there? Because this makes a big difference, because I've already gone through one, two, and three. I want to know the details of your surgery. Had you had a rotor rooter before? Is that how you were diagnosed? Did you get bladder neck scarring and, and Dr. X has been stretching and cutting and stretching and cutting your bladder neck and that's a factor? Did you have surgery and then your margins were positive or your PSA didn't go down and the doctor sent you for radiation? That makes a difference to me as well. And then before the urologist got their hands on you, did you have diabetes? Did you have, had you had a stroke or some neurologic disease? Had you had a lot of pelvic surgeries? And were you on a bunch of medications? Those are the things that I need to know to figure out, okay, what, what's gonna make a difference here? And not all leakage is the same to every man. And uh, I, I have those men that come in and I say, how many pads you wearing? They say six per day. And then I say, well, let me see your pad that you have on. They say, well, here it is. And I look and there's two or three spots of urine on it. And I said, would you change that? He said, absolutely, I'm going to change it. Well, some men are cheap and they will wear one pad all day. Some men are just want to be clean. And so they will change their pad within a drop or two. So if a man is a five pad per day, but he changes it after two drops, that's a lot different than a man who wears one pad per day. But the thing is so heavy, it pulls down his pants by the end of the day. Also, if the man says, well, I wear one pad per day, but he's got a penile clamp on, he's got the, the um, dribble stop, that guy only wears one pad per day because the clamp is picking up the, re the rest of it. If he wears a condom catheter, he tells me, well, I don't wear any pads. And I'm like, well, then you don't have a problem. Well, I wear a condom drainage to a bag on my leg. Well, that's a big deal to me. How many urgencies does he have in a day? And is this affecting his life? If his wife says to me, doctor, he doesn't even leave the house because of his leakage, that's a big deal to me. If the guy says, well, I'm dancing, I'm, I'm loving life, and I wear two or three pads per day, then that's a totally different man because maybe he doesn't need any treatment because he's quite comfortable with how he is at. So I care about all this stuff when I'm trying to make my decision with you. Now, you will remember if you had your prostate surgery that you went out and bought pads, you didn't know what you were supposed to buy. 
There's some, just some shields, there's some pull-ups, and then there's some heavy-duty ones. And so there are many different types of pads. And I try and figure out what kind of pads you're wearing and when you change them, just so I have an idea of how wet you are. I usually, often I will actually meet you for your very first time at cystoscopy because I, I, I need to assess your urethra. I'm considering putting a $6,000 device around your water channel here and I need to know how this is. Do you have scarring there? Have you had radiation with burns there? Do you have some narrowing along the water channel? Is your sphincter intact? These are all things I'm, in, I'm doing. So if you say, why is that guy gonna scope me? It's because I need to know what I'm dealing with. I often will put you through urodynamics. Some of you have been in this room at Rocky View. This is the urodynamics room. This is where we put the tubes inside of you and then we get you to fill up, we get you to cough, we get you to strain, and we're trying to figure out when does leakage occur? When do you get urgency? And this is really important to me because it's gonna determine, are we gonna try medications first? Are we moving straight to surgery? What are our options? And this is unfortunately a necessary step. It's necessary for me to figure out what's going on. And uh, at least the nurses are nice. Now, treatments. All right, so pelvic floor exercises. I bring this up to be complete, but I always think of this. I mean, look at Oprah, richest lady on the planet. She fell off the wagon and got heavy again. She's got everybody helping her stay fit. So how are the rest of us ever going to get strong enough in our pelvic floor if the richest lady in the world with all the helpers in the world get, falls off the wagon again? So I bring this up, but it is for really motivated people that are capable of learning their pelvic floors, doing them diligently, and making a difference. So I bring that up because don't feel like a failure if you think, well, how come I couldn't beat this with Kegels alone? You, you sometimes can't. You cannot strengthen your pelvic floor strong enough to prevent this leakage. There are external devices we'll talk about, and then the surgical procedures, the invents, the advance, and the artificial sphincter. Those are the surgeries that I do. So it is worth a try, absolutely, especially in the early period, to see if you can make a difference by learning to strengthen the pelvic floor. And I am not an expert on how to do a Kegel. One man described it as, I need that sensation of pulling a, p a pencil up my penis and that tightening like I'm trying to suck it off the table. So I imagined that, and you don't actually put the pencil up there. That's not what stops the leakage. But it's that feeling is that you can swoop it up. <laughs> Pelvic physiotherapy, if you say, well, I'm just not making any progress, I will usually send you to a lady. Some of you have met Yolanda Liu. Some of you have met Susan Soretsky, Merle Morton. These are ladies that are specialists in pelvic floor physiotherapy, and they will try and help you to educate your pelvic floor and get you better. And I think it's worth a try, especially in the first couple of months, because most of the time, I can't offer you treatment because I'm not sure if you're going to get better on your own anyway yet. Um, this, this was one device called the Geezer Squeezer, and this is our own Calgary inventor, um, Mr. Rennick. This is the dribble stop, and uh, this is available right here in Calgary. Um, Mr. Rennick sells these from his house, and you can contact him on the website and just Google dribble stop. Some men like this, some men don't. Is it, there you are. And I've sent many men up to you. I print it out and I say, you got to go up and see this guy. Some men love it, some men don't. Some men wear them, some men don't. Some men only wear them when they go out, some men wear them all the time. Sam I am. Green eggs and ham. <laughs> but I, I do print this out in cystoscopy and I usually write on it and I say, give this guy a call because this is something that we could consider. Not everybody's a candidate for surgery. Not everybody's interested in surgery, because like I say, right here, surgery, not again. Surgery got you into this trouble often. And so how are we going to get you out? And here I come talking about surgery again. So if this works for you, I absolutely recommend that people try it. But it doesn't work for everybody, just like the other treatments don't work for everybody. Now. Surgery. So there's three options. There's the advanced male sling, the advanced male sling, and the artificial urinary sphincter. 
I'm going to mention this one. I've done a lot of them. Disappointed. I'm not doing them anymore. Um, I, just not, I just haven't been happy with it. I'm going to show you what it is, though. So here is a slide right from American Medical Systems. Um, this is the, the company that makes the devices. Great company, make a great product. And they make these devices, and then they make the AMS. This is the artificial urinary sphincter. And again, it's really a sliding scale from mild right through to severe. So mild and then severe. Basically, in my practice, if you are more than two pads, so if you're three pads or more, I think you should have a sphincter. It is the gold standard. It is the best. It is the ultimate treatment. It's not perfect, but it's the best treatment. And I honestly have been a little bit disappointed by the male slings, and I'm not convinced that I'm doing my best work with these devices. They really are for the mild guy, in my opinion. Remember, the lawyer said I could say that. Now, they're appealing because I could do them first, and then if it didn't work, a man could have an artificial sphincter. So it doesn't mean, hey, I had that, and now I've blown all my chances. It doesn't mean that. It is effective treatment. It is a sling, which I'm going to show you. The benefits are, you know, immediately whether you're dry or not. You don't have to wait six weeks for activation. There's nothing for the patient to operate, so you walk into the toilet and you pee just as if you were before surgery. And it doesn't mean that I can't talk to you about an artificial sphincter down the road. So what is it? Well, the male sling, this is the Invance, this is the one I'm not doing anymore, is a bone anchor. So I'll just show you here. Basically, I had a screwdriver in surgery, and I put three screws into the bones of the pelvis with stitches on them. And then if we go back up here, there was a mesh that sat, and the urethra, that's the water tube, sits there. And I was trying to compress it, squeeze it, so that it was closed when you're playing golf, doing your activities. It wasn't that it was a bad device. People had horrible um, side effects. It's just that I wasn't happy that I was doing what I wanted to do, and that is get people dry. Um, the benefits were you could just have it done, and you'd know by the next day whether you were better, although you were awfully sore underneath the, underneath the scrotum as if I'd punched you there. So some guys in um, Europe, they said, let's try this advance, because we've been doing what's called a tension-free vaginal tape on women for a long time. Fantastic device. I love it. I highly recommend that it if you have coughing, sneezing, leakage as a woman. But it had risks. So some doctors developed what's called the trans obturator tape. And if I move over here, this, this is the pelvis where the bladder sits. And this is the obturator foramen. This is a, a hole that we all have in our bones. And so the, the idea of these slings is that you take advantage of that area when, you, when you're passing your needles. And I'll show you in the cartoon. But if you say trans obturator tape, that's because this is called the obturator or opening. And I'll show you what it is. So there it is. See down the bottom here, we've got a hammock that sits and it goes through the obturator. So I placed that at the time of surgery. And there is a sling sitting underneath the urethra, the urethra being the water channel. And it goes on both sides. It can be done under a spinal anesthetic. I make an incision underneath here, right between the, your, your scrotum and your anus, a small incision. And then there's two little pokes right in the groin where I bring out this tape. It's all inside of you, so you can't see it. And it's, it's a new device, and it's basically designed to to position the urethra, and the theory is that men leak after because their urethra has fallen out of the, the ability of the sphincter to grab it. I don't know if I buy this, but this is what the company experts say. And so the idea of the sling is to move it back up so it can be squeezed by the urethra. I don't know. This is a relatively new device, and um, by that I mean I learned in uh, the fall of 2007 I'm probably at about 20 devices, and I would give it about a 70 or 80%. I've had some absolute home runs, and I've had some people where they've had one of these, and now I've done an artificial sphincter. 
So if you sit across from me and you say, Doc, I have one pad a day or two pads per day, it really bugs me. I'm going to say, well, what about when you go hiking? What about when you mow the lawn? What about when you do this? Are you really wet then? And if you are really wet in those situations, I'm going to try to talk you out of this. This is appealing because it's much less hardware than what I'm going to show you with the sphincter. But is this the cat's meow? No, we're not there yet. As opposed to a sling in women, which I love, this is a sling in men, which I think is a good device in the right guy, but it's not, we're not there yet. We haven't won. Um, this is a great device. Now, it is not perfect. And I think in this room, there's at least two men that I've put sphincters in, and they can tell you personally whether they think it's a good device or a bad device. But the majority of men are glad they had this done. We'll come to that. So what this is, is there's a cuff that I place around the urethra. That's a silicon cuff. It runs a tube to the pump. The pump sits in the scrotum, so it's all hidden. And then the other tubing runs up to a reservoir which sits next to your bladder up, up behind here. It takes me about 50 minutes to put it in in the operating room. You go home the next day, often quite bruised on the scrotum. And uh, there's about six weeks of recovery, but the device is not turned on until six weeks later. Six weeks later, you come to my office, I give this pump one heck of a squeeze, and I activate the system. And you still pee and fill up normally, but it's, um, it does require an extra step. So you need to go into the bathroom and squeeze that little pump. I'll show you some more pictures. It is the gold standard. It has been around the longest. And it is a good device for the guy that is soaking wet. If you are absolutely soaking and you wear pads all the time, this is a good device. But it's, it may not get you perfect. You may not be pad free. Because if I exerted enough pressure to squeeze your urethra so you're pad free, the thing will squeeze right through the urethra and it'll fail really quickly. So it exerts a gentle pressure to kiss the edges of the urethra together, hold back the urine here, and then when you squeeze the pump, give the pump a squeeze, the fluid moves out of the cuff, through the pump, into the reservoir. You can pee, and then after about a minute or two, the cuff starts to squeeze because the fluid moves back through. The pump allows it to squeeze and tighten this up and you're back to being dry again. You're not 100% dry, but it is the best that we have, and I personally still think that this is a great device. I, I really like this device. Here's an appearance when you're doing a scope. There it is closed, and there it is open. And it's just a small pump that is inside the scrotum, closed and open. So you can say, well, won't he leak a drop or two through there? He might do, but most men are quite a bit drier by having this done. Now, you can't, you got to be able to use your hands because it's got a pump. You got to know what I did to you. You've got to be in continent for at least six months because you might get better on your own. And then your desire to be dry or nearly dry outweighs your fears of having another surgery. And why is that? Because there's risks. This is so if you heard, oh, my friend had his hip done, he got infection, Doc was back in there taking it out. This is silicon and Gore-Tex, and it is at risk of infection. It's a low risk, but it's not no risk. It's higher if you've got diabetes as well. It's higher if you've got a spinal cord injury. And so it's not a no risk. Erosion as well. That cuff can squeeze right through that urethra and show up in a spot it shouldn't be. Very low chance, but not no chance. And with time, it can squeeze it such that it stops working as well. Also, there is a mechanical failure rate. So you are fantastic, you're loving life, and boom, you call me because all of a sudden you're soaking wet and you say, I gotta be dry. And um, this, th this is because something's happened and it's, it's affected it. And usually it's a simple surgery though where we have to change one piece of the device. But I really like it. So again, here it is. This is all implanted inside of you. The only thing you can feel is the pump, but you've got a cuff, and then you've got a reservoir, and then the tubing, and it's all hidden on the inside. Nobody can tell you have one. 
People are glad they had it. When you do surveys, 90% are satisfied. The majority of men are down to one pad per day. These guys may have gone from wearing a condom drainage and a, and a full pull-up down to one pad per day. Not perfect, I'll admit. Most people would recommend it to a friend. And uh, these are people that they like. They would say, hey, he should have it done. That's 96% uh, that's of people would do that in studies. I think it's fantastic. I think it's the best thing. I think you should ask your urologist if you're not happy with how you are and um, tell them that I talked about it because they know that I talk about it all the time, that I like it. Now, just to summarize, so we, we talked about three types of leakage. Overflow, that's the beaver dam where you're dribbling a bit all the time. We talked about the urgency, that's that desire that you gotta pee right now. And then we talked about stress incontinence. That's the most common one. Usually, if it's affecting the quality of life, you wanna talk to your doctor about it and say, is there something we can do? If, if you do come to work up, most of the time we can sort out what's going on with three simple tests. Simple for me to do, but I've never had anything up my penis, so what do I know really? But it's, uh, it's really for me to sort out what's going on. And honestly, the effective treatment is usually the sphincter. The sling is there for the mild guy. And then my preference is the artificial sphincter, unless you're mild, and then we could consider the male sling. And I thank you guys for your time. I'm happy to take questions. No questions. Not a single question. Yeah, I got one. Okay. I've always got one. I, I had what I call, I had a, a rat, I can yell out, I got a big voice. No, you're not loud enough for everybody else though. Okay. I had a radical. Right, right, as though you're eating an ice cream cone. I had a radical in the 202, Sorry. and I'd, I'd say after, I had a mild urgency compared to what you described. Yeah. But I had a relapse this last year, and I finished radiation 10 weeks ago, and the problem was completely gone. Wow. Right. I, I have just like I was normal before even surgery. Can you explain that one? So now if your urgency went away and but and leakage, you didn't really have trouble with leakage. I had a little. A little bit. But it's, it's gotten, gotten better. Gone completely. Yeah. yeah. So we can look at that. Fantastic. We should all clap actually. Thank goodness it went away. I can't really explain why radiation made it better. Sometimes it'll make it worse. Sometimes it'll stay about the same. Um, if you were wet before and now you're dry, the only thing that comes to my mind is in some way did we actually increase the resistance in your water channel by, by radiating the tissue. We tighten it up, basically we starve it of oxygen. That's how radiation works. And so are you a little better because you've got some narrowing in there? But hey, we'll take it. Yeah, take it. Thank you. I had cryo 10, 12 years ago. Yeah. And, uh, and then subsequently, uh, about five years later, I had to have radiation. Everything was going fine. And uh, then uh, I developed, uh, they say I had radiation cystosis. Yeah. And so I had to catheterize myself every time I wanted to boil. Yeah. Then I went and I did hyperbaric treatment that was supposedly going to cure the scar tissue in the urethra. Now I've got leakage. <laughs> I mean, I just went from not being able, and now I'm leaking all the time. Yeah. So you're a tough cookie. I mean, you're, you're the type of guy I read the letter and I think, oh, jeepers, here we go. Um, but I like the challenge, and often Dr. Donnelly will involve me in cases like that because it's a challenge. Hyperbaric, fantastic for radiation cystitis, sometimes. Um, you had to self-catheterize. I actually cut that part out of my talk because I didn't want to put you off. The fact that the bladder neck scarring sometimes will get people to self-catheterize. I would worry a little bit by your story that maybe you are that guy that is now full and you're leaking a bit all the time. 
But then sometimes someone like you will say to me, but when I've tried to catheterize, I'm empty. So then I start to think, well, the radiation and the cryotherapy has basically nuked your sphincter and you're becoming an open, rigid pipe. And to get better in that situation, we have to talk, start talking about a sphincter. So I got to rule out the obstruction. And then if, it's not, if you're not obstructed and I can sail in there with my telescope, then I've got to start talking to you about a sphincter. Yeah, and you're not too old. There's people that are almost 90, and what the heck? If you if you drive for another three years, five years, it's worth it, in my opinion. That's a lot less pads to buy. <laughs> Dr. Gavis, Doc. Yeah. What's the uh, uh, the mileage that you can get out of an artificial sphincter? Do they last ten years, five years? One year or whatever. Yeah, with the original device came in 1972. So there's two things that came in 1972, the sphincter and me. So they've modified it over time. All I can really say is the majority of men at 10 years, it's working. They haven't had a procedure done. So at 10 years. And uh, when I pulled my own 38 patients that I had done in the first four years up until September, um, there were three people that I had either infection, erosion, or had a mechanical change. So there, there we go, say three out of 38, less than 10% of people, where I'd had to go back in and do something. So, and that's just over four years. One guy was a pump thing had to be changed. It actually hit a little hole in his reservoir. Don't know what, it could have actually been a, from a, a hernia mesh that he had years ago. It put a little hole in the reservoir. I changed him, and then two guys that had infection, um, and infection comes about right at the time of surgery. We still don't know what causes it. There's lots of precautions I take, but just it happens. And so when I look at it, the majority of guys are doing pretty good at five years, the majority. So I kind of give you that 90% of guys at five years are good, and I expect we're going to be somewhere in the 80% at 10 years. How do you feel the uh, success rate is for those individuals that are willing to do the exercise program diligently? Yeah. Um, well, there are a group of very motivated people. And I have a, a guy in Canmore. Everybody in Canmore seems to be healthy. I did his radical. And man, if he isn't wet, and I've put in a, a sling on him, and uh, he's not perfect, and I'm going to change it to a sphincter. So my own guy, with my own hands. And I said to him at his first follow-up PSA at two months, how are you doing? He said, I'm wet. I said, well, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm, I'm running six miles a day. Like, well, you're running six miles a day? So here's a very motivated guy. So I thought, you're exactly the guy that's going to get dry with, with Kegel exercises, biofeedback, working with the pelvic floor physiotherapist, and he didn't get there. And I thought, that guy is so motivated. But if you were that person, and you physically, you make a commitment to exercise, you're the type A personality where you've always met the challenges of your job and life, you're exactly the guy that I think you should go. But honestly, if you come in to see me and you have a giant belly and you can't control your diabetes and you haven't given up your smoking, I look at, I honestly look at that person and think, well, how are we going to make any progress by you diligently exercising your pelvic floor? So I want to give people hope, and I usually do involve the pelvic floor physiotherapy for two reasons. One, I know that time will often get most people better, but secondly, there are those guys that can get dry with it, but it's, it, it's I think it's a small number. I, I think it's a small number of people. Worth a try, though. Uh, how long would it one have to wait for the surgery for a speaker? Yeah, um, typically what I do is I do them several times a year, try to put them all together on one day. So I, I usually will implant sometime within six months, six months from when I get the referral. There's many reasons why I don't get to it. Some guys can't make up their mind on whether they want it done. Some guys need to talk to lots of people. Some guys want to finish the golf season. 
Some guys want to go south in the winter. So if you talk to your friends, you're like, wow, I had to wait a year. It's like, well, yeah, what were you doing in that year? So I will try and get them done, but yeah, there's, there's a wait, there's a wait. Anybody else? How much cancer do you have to have uh, before you qualify for any of these prostate? Oh, you, well, once your prostate's out, and let's say you're cured of cancer, you qualify. At the same time, if you're not cured of your prostate cancer, we know that for the majority of men, they're not going to die instantly of prostate cancer. So I say, let's do it. I, I honestly don't have a trouble, unless, you're, unless, unless the man is in imminent danger of passing on. But if he's physically fit and he hates being wet and his life expectancy is reasonable, several years, then I, I don't have a problem with doing this. Whether you're cured or whether you've still got disease, I think your quality of life is worth trying. How much does hereditary uh, influence that one? Yeah, to, to whether you're wet. Whether you're going to get cancer, prostate cancer. Whoa, do we have another hour? Um, it's, it's, that's a tough one because absolutely, you're, if your brother had it, you're at a 2.5 times increased risk of getting it yourself. If you start putting in dads and brothers, your numbers start going up. So let's assume you've got it, we've treated it, and then we're going to talk about it. had a biopsy. And I was told to have 15 percent cancer cells. Yeah. So no. does that put me in surgery or fracture therapy or? Well, I don't want to go off topic because I mean that's a topic I could spend an hour on. Um, just from what you said, depends on so many factors. Your PSA, but that's that's a reasonable amount. It's a small amount. Gets our attention, and depending on your age, your PSA, and other factors. Um, it, it definitely is within the realm of surgery and all the options, but we could, yeah, that's okay. So any other questions, guys? And I'm happy, there's a whole bunch of prosthesis on erectile dysfunction that we can't have time for today. It's a big topic, even what I covered. Up front, I do have some brochures on the devices that I do, and um, you're welcome to come up and see them and uh, take one home and you're also welcome to talk to your urologist, urologist about these devices or you're going to come and talk to me. Okay, thank you guys for your attention.